What does heaven look like? When you hear the word heaven, you may think of clouds, pearly gates, streets of gold, and mansions. But did you know that the Bible doesn't describe heaven this way at all? Not even once. Now I know what you're thinking. Hold the phone. The Bible definitely says that there are mansions and streets of gold in heaven. I'm sure of it. Well, technically, no, it doesn't. Not exactly, anyway. Let me explain what I mean. We'll have to start with a definition. The word heaven is used many times in the scriptures. However, in ancient times, it could refer to the sky. Like in Genesis 1.20, which tells us that the birds fly in the expanse of heaven. Or it could refer to what we call outer space. Like in Genesis 1.14-17, through 17, which tells us that God put the stars in the expanse of heaven. But it could also refer to the place where the throne of God sits, from which he sovereignly presides over all things, like in Genesis 24, 3, which tells us that the Lord, Yahweh, is the God of heaven, or the supreme being presiding over all the universe. The Apostle Paul referred to these three things called heaven in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, where he wrote that he knew a man, and he was almost certainly referring to himself, who was caught up into the third heaven, also known as paradise, and he heard unspeakable words which it is not lawful for a man to utter. This is what I mean by heaven when I refer to it in this particular study. The third heaven, not the sky or outer space. I mean the place where God currently sits upon his throne right now, presiding as sovereign over the entire universe. I'm asking, what does that place look like? Now, if you think the streets there are paved with gold, you may be confusing things just a little bit. The phrase about a gold street that many people associate with heaven comes from the book of Revelation chapter 21. There, the apostle John wrote that he saw a city, the New Jerusalem, and the twelve gates of that city were twelve pearls, the pearly gates. Also, the street of that city was pure gold, as it were transparent glass. But this city is not heaven, or at least it's never called heaven, and it couldn't be a description of the heaven that exists right now where God sits upon his throne. We know this because Revelation 21 begins with a shocking announcement. The apostle John saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and he saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of, apparently, that new heaven. So, in the future, after Jesus returns and after he purges the earth of sin and judges the wicked, God will create a new heaven and a new earth, and the city that John described is not said to be either of those two things. It's not heaven and it's not earth. It's a future tabernacle of God where he will forever dwell with his redeemed people and where we shall see him face to face, but it's not a heaven, it's a city, and it will exist after God makes everything new. It's not the place where God's throne sits right now. This new Jerusalem is also probably the place that Jesus referred to in John 14 when he said, In my Father's house are many mansions, I go to prepare a place for you. My point is that the question for this video is not what will the new Jerusalem look like in the future when God makes a new heaven and a new earth, though that is a video I do plan to make at some point in the future. The question for today is, what does the Bible tell us about the heaven that exists today? What does the place where God's throne is right now look like at this moment? Surprisingly, to answer that question, we have very few passages of Scripture to analyze. The Bible almost never describes what heaven looks like today. There are 66 books that make up what we call the Bible, but only one of those 66 books actually tells us anything certain about what heaven looks like. Even in the Old Testament, in passages like Isaiah 6, where the prophet Isaiah saw Yahweh God sitting on his throne high and lifted up, we still don't see a description of heaven. Though he said that he also saw angelic beings called seraphim who flew around appraising God, 
which does sound like it might be an account of Isaiah's visit to the throne room in heaven, unfortunately, that doesn't seem to be the case. He did see the throne of God, there's no doubt of that, but another prophet, Ezekiel, also saw the throne of God. Only when he saw it, it descended to the earth, or to the sky directly above where Ezekiel was on the earth. You can read about that in Ezekiel 1, 26-28. The point is that if the throne of God can appear on the earth sometimes, then the fact that Isaiah saw it doesn't necessarily mean that he went to heaven. Furthermore, the words of Isaiah suggest that the prophet was actually in the temple of God in Jerusalem, on the earth, not in heaven, because he said that the train of the robe of Yahweh filled the temple, and when the seraphim cried out the praises of God, the posts of the door moved, and the house was filled with smoke. Then in verse 6, a seraphim flew to Isaiah, having a coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from off the altar. So the passage references the temple, the posts of the door, the house, and the altar, and these all seem to be clues that Isaiah was in the temple of God in Jerusalem when God's presence appeared there, not in heaven. Now this absence of heavenly visions in the 39 books of the Bible that we call the Old Testament shouldn't surprise us. We really shouldn't expect that anyone would be given a glimpse of heaven before Jesus came to pay for our sins on the cross and open the way by which sinners may enter the presence of God in heaven. In fact, Jesus even said as much in his conversation with Nicodemus in John 3.13. No man, he said, hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. But what about the other 27 books, the New Testament of Scripture, written after the death and resurrection of Jesus? Do we see descriptions of heaven there? Surprisingly, only one. We mentioned earlier that apparently the Apostle Paul went to the third heaven, either physically or in a vision, according to 2 Corinthians 12. But he didn't give us any account of what it looks like there. Only one New Testament author was inspired to write an actual description of heaven, and as I mentioned before, that description is found in only one book of the Bible. He was the Apostle John, and he saw the throne of God in heaven and wrote about it in the book of the Revelation. If we want to know what heaven looks like right now, we have no other source in the Bible other than the book of Revelation, specifically chapters 4 through 15. We'll find most of our information in chapter 4, so let's begin there. In verse 1, John was called up into heaven, and the first thing he beheld there was the throne of God. Here's how he described it. The one who sat on the throne looked like a jasper and sardine stone, and the throne itself was surrounded by a rainbow that looked like an emerald. Out of the throne came lightning, thunder, and voices, and he saw seven burning torches before the throne, in addition to a sea of glass like unto crystal. Wow! John's description of the throne is very similar to Ezekiel's description of it when it appeared in the sky above his head. Ezekiel also mentioned the brightness of a rainbow that surrounded the throne and a sea of glass that he called a crystal expanse, or firmament, which the throne was sitting on. The difference, however, is that John saw the same throne when it was in heaven, not on the earth. Now, the description of the throne seems to illustrate to us the triune God who sits there. For instance, the seven torches, or lamps, before the throne represent the Spirit of God, the third person of the Trinity whose work is perfect and whole, as symbolized by the number seven, which is seen throughout the Bible representing completion, wholeness, and perfection. Then, the thundering and lightnings coming from the throne seem to represent God the Father, whose voice was heard from Mount Sinai with thunder and lightning and great noise. Finally, in chapter 5, we will see the Son of God enter the scene and approach the throne. This majestic throne on which sits the eternal triune God Yahweh himself is surely the centerpiece of heaven. Next, we'll consider what is around the throne. First, John saw 24 seats, and on those seats sat 24 elders, or human leaders of God's people, clothed in white raiment and having crowns of gold on their heads. 
I've already made more than one video attempting to explain in detail why these elders must represent God's believing people from all time who now find themselves resurrected and seated in heaven around the throne. Check out those videos if you'd like to hear more about my reasoning for that. In addition to the elders, John saw four beasts flying around the throne who look very similar to the seraphim described by Isaiah when he saw God in the temple. Next, it's essential that we note that John seemed to arrive in heaven just in time for a special ceremony, because when those seraphim, or beasts, praised God, the 24 elders fell down to worship him and cast their crowns at his feet. With this action, the ceremony commenced, and we'll see it progress throughout the rest of the book of Revelation. In chapter 5, those proceedings continue. In verse 1, John noticed a large scroll resting at the right hand of him who sat on the throne. This scroll seems to be connected with the kingdom of God, and we can guess that it represents some sort of deed or title to the kingdoms of the earth. Next, an angel stepped forward and in a loud voice asked if anyone was worthy to come and take the book and open the seals. Is anyone worthy to step forward and possess the kingdoms of the earth? At that question, the ceremony came to a standstill, as all of heaven allowed the great problem to sink in. No man was worthy. The silence must have been so great that John began to weep. But one of the elders watching the procession turned to John and reassured him that this was all a ceremony. It's all planned, man. Someone called the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, which is clearly a reference to Jesus Christ, has already prevailed and shown himself worthy to open the scroll and take possession of the earth. The angel's question was all part of the formal procession, the inauguration ceremony of Jesus, if you will. Everyone in heaven already knew the answer. The Lion of Judah was about to enter and demonstrate that he has the authority to take the scroll. Then John saw him, the worthy one, who had the right to take the title deed to the earth and bring about the eternal kingdom of God. But he didn't look like a lion. Instead, he appeared on the scene in this ceremony first as a lamb, apparently dripping with blood as if he'd recently been slain and having seven horns and seven eyes. Now, the horns of an animal or beast in prophecy pretty much always refer to rulers and kings of nations. And as we've mentioned, the number seven refers to perfection and completion. This seems to show that this lamb is the only perfect ruler of the whole earth completely. And his seven eyes are, again, just like the seven torches, a symbol of the Spirit of God and his perfect work, which of course validates the authenticity of Jesus as the worthy King of Kings. This lamb stepped forward to the throne as the whole crowd in heaven watched, and he took the scroll. Immediately, the procession of the ceremony paused again, and the 24 elders, along with the beasts or seraphim, fell down before the lamb, and they sung a song of his redemption, after which, in verse 11, 10,000 times 10,000, or 100 million angels, plus thousands of thousands, or millions more, join with the seraphim and the elders, singing glorious praise to God about how the Lamb was worthy to receive power, riches, wisdom, strength, honor, glory, and blessing. This tells us that the Lamb's receipt of the scroll meant that he had received power, riches, wisdom, etc. And by this, we can surmise that the scroll indeed was a sort of title deed to the authority over the earth that Jesus had purchased with his blood. That's why he appeared as a lamb that had been slain. So we are finding some answers to what heaven is really like, but the challenge in this passage is that some of what we are reading is a ceremony that takes place in the end times specifically. We can guess that this scene, except for all the end times ceremonial things that take place for the revelation of Jesus Christ, is pretty much what heaven is like all the time right now. We can't be sure, but it's all we have to go on. What we'll try to do then is follow this ceremony through the book of Revelation 
to find more tidbits of information that may help shape our understanding of what heaven looks like right now. We just have to weed out the things that seem to be obviously meant only for the end times particularly. Like in chapter 6, when the audience in heaven watched as the Lamb opened each of the seals of that scroll slowly and ceremonially. Upon the breaking of each seal, the receiving of his rightful kingdom came closer and closer, but John noticed that with each seal came terrible destruction on the earth, preparing the earth for Christ's conquering of it. The breaking of the first four seals produced events typified in the four horsemen of the apocalypse. A military leader entered the scene, then came war, famine, and massive death. These don't tell us much about what heaven is like right now, but when the Lamb opened the fifth seal, John saw the souls of martyrs appear in heaven in a place he describes as under the altar. Now this is a fascinating verse for our study for a couple of reasons. First, remember that the 24 elders, which represented resurrected believers, seem to have heavenly bodies, not just souls, and they have already received rewards for their labors on the earth, hence the crowns that they cast at the throne in chapter 4. The elders are not a picture of what it's like for people who die right now and wait for the coming resurrection. They are a picture of people who have already been resurrected. When a believer dies right now, their souls go to heaven to await the new bodies they'll be given in the resurrection, very much like these souls in chapter 6 who had not been resurrected yet. So if we want to know what heaven is like right now, we would want to study these souls in chapter 6. Studying the elders who have already been resurrected by the time of this ceremony won't tell us about what it's like for souls who go to heaven right now. So then these souls in chapter 6 are certainly worth examining more closely, because what they are doing is probably the same kind of things that souls in heaven are doing right now. And what were they doing? Well, John heard them crying out to God for justice on those who murdered them. This shows us that heaven is not a place where only happiness is allowed. They seem to naturally mimic the attitude of God, and when God is angry against those who martyred his people, souls in heaven are also righteously angry. But there is another fascinating concept about heaven that we are introduced to in this verse. That is, that in heaven there is a temple. Now, in the Old Testament, the people of Israel were to worship God in a central tent called the tabernacle, which was essentially a rather simple structure surrounded by an outer gate, which created a court. In the court of the tabernacle was a large altar for sacrifice and a laver where priests would wash himself before entering the tent of the tabernacle. Inside the tent were two chambers. The first was called the holy place, where priests would offer incense on a small altar symbolizing the prayers of the people, and there was also a candlestick and a table for the priestly bread there. In the second chamber of the tabernacle, called the Holy of Holies, there was only one piece of furniture called the Ark of the Covenant. Now later, Solomon, the son of David, built a beautiful permanent structure to replace the tent of the tabernacle, which he called the temple. But John reveals to us in Revelation that there is also a similar temple in heaven. Here in chapter 6, he mentions the souls of those who were seen under the altar, presumably the altar of sacrifice in the court of the temple in heaven. In chapter 11, we're told that the temple of God was opened in heaven and there was seen in his temple the Ark of his Testament. This John wrote of again in chapter 14 when he saw an angel coming out of the temple which is in heaven. And in chapter 15, we read this, After that I looked and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened, and then later the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. So there's definitely a temple in heaven. Now you might be asking, where is this temple in relation to the throne of God? Is it in front of the throne or behind it, or is it to the left or to the right? Or is the throne inside of the temple? Well, we don't know. 
It seems, at least, that the temple is separate from the throne, because if the throne was inside the temple, John would have been inside the temple when he saw the throne in chapter 4. Yet, when he mentioned the temple, he saw it from the outside looking in, not from the inside looking out. He saw those outside the temple under the altar in chapter 6, but didn't see the Ark of the Covenant until the temple was opened for him to look inside in chapter 11. So, there is a temple of God in heaven, and God's throne is probably not inside of it. If I had to guess, I'd say maybe the throne is situated above the temple, like the presence of God in the pillar of cloud that rested above the tabernacle of Moses in the wilderness. But whatever it is, we know that it is there in heaven, and that adds to our limited understanding of what heaven looks like. Now, let's return to examining the ongoing ceremony that was taking place in chapter 6. After Jesus broke six of those seven seals on the scroll, the procession took another pause, and in chapter 7, massive praise broke out in heaven again. Then, in chapter 8, the ceremonial pause being completed, Jesus opened the seventh seal of the scroll, and all of heaven paused once again. This time, there was complete silence in heaven for half an hour. This gives us at least one additional piece of information about the reality of heaven. There is time there. Some have imagined that heaven exists outside of the constraints of time itself, but this does not appear to be the case. Otherwise, how could there be silence in heaven for half an hour? Now, this ceremony that began in chapter 4 proceeds all the way through until it reaches its finality with Jesus in chapter 19, riding to the earth on a white horse to claim the kingdom that he'd rightfully received, and destroying all wickedness in the process. We'll examine the rest of the ceremony in a later video, but there's no further information that I can tell about what heaven looks like, so let's recap what we've gathered. Since this is the only book that tells us anything about this subject, this is really all we can know for sure about what heaven looks like right now. God's throne is obviously the central focus of heaven. It sits upon a crystal platform and is circled with a brilliant rainbow. Seraphim fly around it crying praise to the triune God, and souls who die truly do go to heaven, even before their bodies are resurrected. They enjoy the presence of the Lord, and apparently they mirror his attitude of righteousness and holiness. Additionally, we found fascinating information that there is indeed time in heaven. There's also more than a hundred million angels there, and there is a beautiful heavenly temple as well. That's a lot of really cool information, but that is also all we know about what heaven is like right now. What we know must be less than 1% of 1% of the wonders of that place. What do you think? In this study, we've not only attempted to answer the question, what does heaven look like? We've also discovered a foundation for reading the book of Revelation. When we realize that chapters 4 through 19 describe a long, drawn-out ceremony in heaven, which has residual effects in judgments that take place on the earth, it gives us a foundational perspective through which we can begin to attempt to interpret the prophecies of the book. But do you think I got something wrong in this analysis? Whether you agree or disagree, I'd love to hear what you think in the comments below. Now, before I go, I want to sincerely thank you for watching this video. If you like this content, don't forget to hit subscribe to support the channel and to see more content like this. You can follow The Bible Explained on Facebook, too, at facebook.com forward slash The Bible Explained. Also, I want to give a big thanks to the folks at videobible.com for letting me use their awesome artwork in this video. Check them out on YouTube, and don't forget to hit subscribe. Now, I simply can't leave without reminding you that the entire Bible is ultimately about one thing, the redemption of mankind by Jesus Christ. 
You see, the Bible tells us that all men are sinners, and justice demands that we depraved sinners pay for our crime against God for eternity in hell. That's definitely bad news. But the Bible is all about this good news, that Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay the penalty for our sin. Since that penalty has been paid, all that is required of you is that you turn by faith to the Lord and find salvation in Him. If you've never chosen Christ by faith and received this gift of God, won't you do that today? Leave a comment or send me a private message on Facebook, and I'll be happy to talk to you more about having your sins forgiven by Jesus Christ.